Get a proper job. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Good evening team, it's 8 o'clock and I'm Lawrence Fox. Tonight we're going to take a look at Western civilization's imminent collapse. Yippee! What's causing this, you might wonder? The war in Ukraine? Global supply chains faltering, record-breaking inflation? No, it's because we're not making enough babies. Also, the Home Office have admitted that at least 200 children have gone missing from migrant hotels and they're facing calls for an inquiry. Does it beg the question, when will this disastrous policy come to an end and do these children not matter? And then we're going to be talking about electric cars. Are they the future or shall, should they be banned by 2030? Well, they're proving to be fairly poor investments as prices continue to plummet. But we want to look at the ethics of having Congolese kids mining the required cobalt for these supposed climate curing machines. And finally, what gender was Jesus? Well, I thought he was a man, but a new production of Jesus Christ Superstar has cast a non-binary actor, yeah, of course it has, to play the son, or should I say, the they them child of people kind of God. And don't forget, most importantly, I want to hear from you. So send me your views at gbviews uh, at gbviews.uk. <laughs> right, that's all coming up after news with Polly Mental Host. Let's start this bulletin with some breaking news coming to us in the last 20 minutes or so concerning the British voluntary aid workers, Andrew Bagshaw and Chris Parry, who you may remember were missing in Ukraine. Well, I can tell you that the aid workers, Andrew Bagshaw and Chris Parry, have been confirmed as killed while attempting a humanitarian evacuation from the Ukrainian town of Solidar. Mr Parry's family made the statement, which has been released through the British Foreign Office, the FCDO, the pair were last seen on January the 6th. They had been delivering aid to civilians following heavy attacks from Russia. So confirmation now that those two British voluntary aid workers, Andrew Bagshaw and Chris Parry, have been found. And it's understood they were killed while attempting to help civilians in war-torn Ukraine. More detail on that, of course, as we get it. Well, on the back of that, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has reportedly caved in and decided to send Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine and is allowing other countries like Poland to do the same. Reports are suggesting a decision on whether or not to allow Poland to send the tanks could be made as early as this week. And that follows Poland's request to Germany for their approval to send up to 14 of the battle tanks to Ukraine. The Polish Defence Minister said the request came as the security of the whole of Europe was at stake. And Boris Johnson, too, today has been urging other countries to follow the UK's lead in providing the Ukrainians with the weapons they need to win the war. Well, in news here at home, a relative of the murder victim, Zara Alina, says... Probation officers have blood on their hands after a report found her killer was released from prison just days before carrying out the attack. Jordan McSweeney was given a life sentence last month after he admitted killing the law graduate. He attacked 35-year-old Zara in East London as she walked home after a night out last June. The findings show McSweeney should have been treated as a high risk of serious harm offender, but he was wrongly graded by the probation service as a medium risk. Zara's aunt, Faranaz, says more needs to be done to avoid the same thing happening again. Our streets are not safe. Probation work has to be tight, has to be high quality, because the risks, the stake is high. The stake is lives. Zara's life was taken and probation have blood on their hands. 
Well, in happier news to end this bulletin, Princess Eugenie says she and her husband Jack Brooksbank are so excited to be expecting their second child. A photograph released on Instagram by the princess today shows the couple's first child, August, hugging his mum's pregnant bump. In a statement, the palace said the royal family is delighted and August is very much looking forward to being a big brother. Those are your latest news headlines. We're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Time now for Lawrence Fox. Perhaps the best piece of advice any of us lucky to have had a parent, mentor, lover or friend worth their salt has ever given us is trust your instincts. Instincts, those wonderful, primal, indecipherable calls to action or caution, which reveal themselves in the simple binaries of yes or no. The nuance of their language, untranslatable, lost somewhere between the earliest iterations of what mankind started out as and where we are today. We all have them, and we all have examples of the perils faced when they are ignored and the perils avoided when they are given their worthy attention. Billions upon billions of instincts, often of similar character, can dictate the direction and success of a civilization in hardship, but also, when ignored or misdirected, lead to its collapse. For some time now, nagging deep down at the bottom of an ever-growing number of people's guts, sits these instincts, bubbling away, refusing to be quiet. Unable to articulate themselves for the reasons above, the language has been lost in time, but it is persistent and it won't go away. Many people's guts are coming together to say beware and be careful. It is frustrating to analyse as each of us are unique and these instincts are in many ways a reflection of that. For some of us, it is the stamping down of free expression and the subsequent cultural malaise and decline. For others, a sense that their nation has lost its identity and therefore its optimism. And for others, the simplest of things in life to define have suddenly become the most complicated. For example, what is a woman? I remember the heady days of my childhood as electronics became accessible to the masses. The Game Boys, the first ever Nintendo, Walkmans, Gizmos and gadgets which transfixed our minds in awe of this electronic genius. Pretty much every single one came from a faraway place on the other side of the world called Japan. Sony, Hitachi, Mitsubishi, Toshiba. All we had to do was wait another few months and the latest in technological explosion would be available to beg, plead and die for on your birthday. Japan, with her bullet trains and brilliant brains, was the future. That Japan, alas, is no more, and it could be argued that one of the main reasons is a collective Japanese instinct of isolationism and traditionalism. The Japanese are not fond of immigration or even cross-pollination. They have a special pejorative for those of mixed ethnicity, despite their finest tennis player, Naomi Osaka, being just such a person, a hafu or half-breed. As a result of this, the Japanese are facing altogether a more daunting prospect, the end of their civilization as they know it. The reason is demographics. A remarkably healthy population with the longest life expectancy on Earth made the fundamental error not to replace itself. Birth rates are low, life expectancy is high. Pay off your mortgage in Japan nowadays and your house is going to be worth less than it was when you bought it. Supply and demand. Home ownership. Once the beacon of future prosperity has begun to wither on the vine, as Edmund Burke said, society is a partnership between the dead, the living, and those yet to be born. The lesson Japan is learning the hard way. But this general reluctance to breed is symptomatic of all hyper-civilized advanced cultures across the world. Birth rates are plummeting. Japan and other nations are aware of the simple fact that children really are our future and have tried initiative after initiative to convince the population to get jiggy with it. But as all of us know, it's hard to force someone to fall in love and make it family especially if it goes against our precious instincts. In the arrogant and affluent West, children are deeply unfashionable. And any young woman who even quietly voices an ambition to be a mother and raise a family is roundly ridiculed as being yet another hapless victim of this so-called patriarchy. 
Some nebulous idea that men use children and families to keep their women down, control them and stop them succeeding. The result being that when many women manage to turn their gaze away from modernity's hypnotic snake-like gaze, they find their body, which has reminded them like clockwork month after month since puberty, that it has a function and a purpose, no longer can fulfill the purpose for which it was designed. It is one of the quirks, and some might say deep unfairnesses in nature, that men can continue blithely on, creating and creating until their end, whilst women labour under the cruelty of time. But men didn't make the rules to this game, which we all have to play. Nature did. So instead of treating the deeper causes of the illness of modernity, some nations have opted for the sticking plaster approach of open borders and importing the next generation rather than making their own. But this only covers the wound whilst the organs of the nation and the national identity progress to later stage disease. Possibly even hurried on as strangers with different backgrounds and instincts are forced tightly together, whether they like it or not, unable sometimes to even share a language. Other nations say we must work longer now as we live longer. The slack-bellied Western nations cry out in anger, unaware it would seem that they can't have their cake and eat it. Millions gather on the streets in protest at the prospect of more labour, squawking like birds in a nest, waiting for their loving parent, the state, to come and fill their open beaks and empty stomachs with worms. Instinct reveals we may well be witnessing the beginning of the end of society as we know it. Responsibility is being replaced with gluttonous pleasure and the self-indulgence of identity. What is certain is that the collective instinct of the next infantilized generation is not to reproduce. One look at what hypermodernity offers them through these dreaded screens has put them off, and I don't blame them. A perfect cultural straw storm may be brewing to bring the end of the world as we know it. We have all seen glimpses of what must follow, and we are all filled with a certain instinctive dread for our own children. But there is good news, and there is a way out of this. It is to make more humans, to turn towards each other again and commit to the partnership between the dead, the living, and those yet to be born. Is this the end of the world as we know it? Only time will tell. But before anything else, we wanted to ask you, as birth rates plummet across the world, is this the end of the world as we know it? So email your views at GB News or tweet GB News. Here with us in the studio now is author and renowned authority on demography, Paul Morland. Paul, is it the end of the world as we know it? No. I think it's in our hands. Uh, as you say, we have instincts, we have technology. The instincts drive us in a particular direction and always will do. The technology we can choose to apply to limit our fertility or not, we certainly will. I don't think anyone's calling for couples in the Western world to have six or seven children. And it's very good that we're helping people control their fertility in much of the, developed, uh, much of the developing world where it is too high and it needs to come down. But in countries from Britain to Japan to Korea where the fertility rate is even lower than in Japan, it's really up to people, it's up to us. And I'm not inclined to say, let's open our beaks as you put it, and wait for the government to fill them with subsidies. And of course, there are things the governments can do, and perhaps we'll discuss those. The governments can make a difference on the margin, but ultimately it's down to all of us. So it's a fundamental change within us. I think it's cultural. I think it's about belief. It's about confidence in the future. It's about wishing to see yourself, your people, your nation, your community, ultimately humanity go on. And that is something which I think is pretty natural. Having said that, there are some tendencies against that. There are some pretty misanthropic tendencies out there which I think need to be combated. So when I say it's about culture and about belief, I think these are real things that we need to argue about and talk about and push back against. You're sounding dangerously spiritual here. 
you know, this mis misanthropy and then this idea that we need to hope and have more optimism. There does seem to be a dearth of optimism in society at large at the moment, you know, especially with all the terrible news that people have been confronted with time and time again. Do you think there is a spiritual space for hope, the opposite of misanthropy? Well, I think there are philosophical reasons for having children. There are reasons that religious people may offer. There are reasons that humanists might offer. But I think we can't rely on those because they are so debatable. I think what we have to rely on is the practical story that without the next generation of people, the robots are not coming over the horizon to our assistance, that we are going to still need labour, we're going to need people to fill the petrol stations, we're going to need people to be at the airports to deliver our suitcases, we're going to need people in the old age homes looking after our parents and then after us. We have a need for labour. And I think it's incredibly arrogant to say that we're too busy, too inconvenienced, too important to produce that labour ourselves, and that either we will just import it and skim off the best and brightest from the wider world, or wait in the vain hope that technology is going to come and sort it out for us, or indeed expect other people to provide it. I mean, if you have environmental objections to having more children, you will still consume that labour. You're still going to be in the supermarket. You're still going to be in the petrol station. You're still going to be in the airport. And ultimately, one hopes, in the old age home or requiring someone to look after you. So all you're saying, if you won't have children for environmental reasons, is I will consume labour. I'm just not going to produce it myself. Which is, uh, so if we've got on one side misanthropy, on the other side hope and need, in the middle we have hypocrisy, which is what this generation is filled with. And so th these people must realise that when they say you're going to kill the planet if you don't breed, they must know that's a factually incorrect statement. They're just going to destroy their own nation. Is, it, is there an active, positive desire to, dis to kill nations more broadly? Well, I don't want to tar a whole generation with hypocrisy. There are hypocrites in every generation. Well, their, main, their, their main spokespeople are hip, massively hypocritical. Oh, I... COP26, 27, all of these environmental... All these people tapping away on their little lithium battery iPhones are saying the same thing on social media. Yes, and at a higher level, arriving at Davos with their private jets. Yeah, on 250 and, grand a week uh, to have a nice, expensive so prostitute. I, it's not really for you or me, I think, to attribute hypocrisy or a psychological condition to these Who people. Who is it to? I think it's for us. Well, what, what should we be doing? We should be challenging them, questioning them, pointing out the inconsistencies rather than the hypocrisy. So I call you a racist for doing that. Well, I don't think you can call someone a racist for saying that in multi multicultural Britain today, all communities need to have more children. My mother was born overseas, about a third of mums uh, giving birth in the UK today are born overseas. If you call for Britain as a whole, or Germany, or France, to, or indeed China, or, or uh, Japan, or Korea, for the people there to have more children, you're not necessarily calling for more white babies. I, don't, I think the racial issue is a, is a complete red herring. Yeah, but, I mean, everyone is tired of a racist for saying any question that is, goes against... Well, I think the, we just the... ignore that and get on with the facts, don't we? Well, you can ignore it, but it has real-life repercussions on people's lives. Is there something about belonging, about a nation, about saying, I, this is my home, that would encourage people to, to reproduce more, rather than saying, you know, the world's going to end anyway, you might as well live this sort of temporal life of how you identify, there's no point in procreating because the whole thing's going to burn up, as Alessandro Ocasio-Cortex says, um, in 11 years. You know, are we forcing these children through fear, and these young people through fear not to reproduce? Well, this is, this is where I say ideology is terribly important. So if you look at who does have more children, the religion just certainly do have more children. And interestingly, people on the right tend to have more children. People with a stronger sense of national identity tend to have more children. Uh, and in Israel, the only OECD country with an above to re uh, above replacement level fertility rate, they actually have three children per woman. There's a very strong correlation. Well, they, know, they, they know what it's like to be wiped out. And, they ha and, and indeed, they have a sense of vulnerability from the surrounding nations. Now, I'm not calling on the country to become fundamentalistically religious or even supernationalist, but I 
I do think we need a stronger national story, which we can all identify with, including people with entirely overseas ancestors like me, uh, a, a sense of Britishness and a sense of wish, wishing to continue our national story. I think that will certainly play into a higher fertility rate. And I do agree with you that a very atomized society where people don't have an identity and they don't have any kind of faith and they don't have any kind of community is the kind of society where you're going to have a very low Fertility. Having said that, of course, the Japanese do have a strong sense of identity, and they're still not. Well, it's geology. sort of it's sort of you can't have your have your cake and eat it, isn't it? So you can't turn around on the one side and say we need a strong sense of national identity, which involves not rejecting but resisting immigration to fill, plug holes in the economy, and on the other hand, say you know we need to maintain a sense of national identity, but we don't want any immigrants. It's a very it's a, it seems to be a very as you say atomized place, and I think your what your what you've expressed is. is is, you know, a moderate sense of an understanding of how we continue civilization. Well, I pointed this trilemma out actually on GB News before that you have these choices. Japan has effectively chosen out of the three choices it could have, not to have immigration and ethnic change, and not to have large families. And they've taken a real hit on their economy. We in Britain want our economy to grow. We want to keep our GDP up and, and paying, having taxpayers paying into the NHS. At the same time, we don't want many children. And therefore, the only solution for us is if we don't, if we do want a buoyant economy, and we don't want um, uh, uh, stagnation, uh, and yeah. e exactly, and, and we don't want to have large families. Immigration is actually the only solution. Abs absolutely fascinating. I mean, that's the moderate way of expressing what I actually think. Thank you so much, Paul. Right, coming up next, some pretty morbid news for you. The Home Office has confessed that 200 migrant children have gone missing. Did anyone think of? Putting migrants in hotels was going to be a good idea to begin with. We'll be back in three. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprised with me this even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Nice. You have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yes. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us. Across the entire United Kingdom, we cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. 
We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi. A few hours ago, it was revealed that over 200 children seeking asylum have gone missing. The Immigration Minister has claimed there is no evidence these children have been abducted. This, however, contradicts reports provided by other ministers that suggest these children were trafficked from the Home Office-run hotels. Last October, over 100 children went missing after the Home Office started to place channel migrants in hotels. Careless, but not deliberate. Journalists and campaigners had raised alarm that high figures of missing migrant children was an indicator that minors were being trafficked. And it was only just revealed that, that a migrant who was found guilty of murder yesterday had actually murdered two fellow asylum seekers on his way over here. Careless, not deliberate. One can't help but think that the Home Office simply haven't got a clue what they're doing. Here to discuss this with me is Professor at the Centre for Security and Intelligence at Buckingham University, Anthony Glees. Good evening, Anthony. Are these children being trafficked? Good evening. Good evening. Well, I think we have to assume they are being trafficked. And I think there are two really serious issues here. First of all, uh, the, the, the welfare of these children, we, you know, we are responsible for their welfare. 88% of them are Albanians. And I cannot understand why they are in the UK, in any case, they should go straight back to Albania, which is a safe country and a country with whom we have cordial relations. So they shouldn't even be here. But the second issue is that if they are here, we owe a duty of care to them, but we also owe a duty of care to the British people more generally to stop them from being exploited by criminal gangs, criminal gangs clearly in the United Kingdom. So. It's not just the Home Office that is failing in its duty here. Self-evidently, it is uh, the Border Force, above all, I think, the National Crime Agency. It's a primary duty of government to keep this country secure. In fact, many people would say it is the only primary duty a government has to keep its people secure. Well, it's not doing it, and for all her tough words and her smirks and her smiles, Suella Braverman is in many ways making as bad a fist of it as Pretty Patel did. It, it must stop. Well, we, we, you know, it's pretty obvious as you look uh, across the towns uh, all, all over England and across, particularly across the north that we don't care about our own children. So God forbid what happens to a migrant child once they arrive. But, but they, these children are missing. That's what's so terrifying to me is that, is, is that they're missing. And what does the Home Office have to say about it? What infrastructure needs to be put in place to stop people trafficking in a developed nation like Britain? Well, I think there are two things that need to be done. First of all, as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, we need to ensure that those people we pay to keep us safe and to keep people safe in here are fit for purpose. Clearly, that is not the case when it comes to uh, the National Crime Agency, the immigration officers. They're meant to keep people out. But actually, as in the case of this Albanian murderer, they don't keep them out, they let them in. So that question needs addressing. And then, in my view, we need to do something else too. There needs to be an effective wall uh, in France and Belgium to stop people coming by boats to the United Kingdom in the first place. We can't do it in the United Kingdom. We have to do it in France and Belgium. We're not going to fire on these boats of people. We're not going to kill people. That isn't what we do. But we are entitled to stop them. And one of the points about Brexit, although it's uh, denied, and I heard your previous speaker say, oh, you know, we need immigrants. He may well be right. I think he probably is right. But it's not what people voted for. They voted for a clear and firm immigration policy. And 
the Home Secretary has the duty of delivering it. It's blindingly obvious that it has to change. Well, I mean, it seems blindingly obvious to the majority of Brits now that there's no intention to actually complete a Brexit and um, all of these policies are just dust in the wind. But, you know, we had a migrant was found guilty of killing an aspiring Marine the other day. Does it, what does this say about our asylum process? Well, there again, I mean, this person, he didn't come on a small boat, he came on a ferry from Cherbourg to Poole and was examined by immigration officers at Poole and let in. It would appear to be the case that he was let in without any reference whatsoever to the files that would have existed on him in Europe. And there, Lawrence, you see, you make a point, and it's a point that you and I think are going to disagree with. Because for me, for Brexit to work, it can only work together in partnership with European Union countries. We cannot do it by ourselves. Clearly, we can't do it by ourselves. People who come from Albania, 88% of these young people need to be sent back at once before the people traffickers can get their hands on I, 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 it. I, I agree. Being, I, I think on that, being organised for this on, country. On, on, that, on that, we can agree. Uh, I don't think we're even on our own side anymore. Anyway, thank you very much, Anthony. We appreciate your time on this. Coming up, do you enjoy having an electric car? It might disturb you to hear that the cobalt that is in your car, might have been mined by Congolese children. How lovely, the ethics of going electric. He's up next. See you shortly. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, it's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. The special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8 p.m. Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feature? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hola. Now, before we go to my next guests, I asked you earlier, as birth rates are plummeting across the globe, is it the end of the world as we know it? Email me at yourviews at GB News or tweet at GB News. Ken says, yes, Lawrence, we may not be breeding to renew, but we now have 8 billion in the world and we are overcrowded in this country. More people will use up more natural resources. We have a choice, survive or fail. Eugenicist alert. Ian says, who in their right mind would want to bring kids into this world as it is? Well, Ian, come on, we can make a better world. Surely we can do that. We can't just stare backwards in misery. A Twitter user says, when you have two opposing cultures and one is weak, the stronger one will take over. And that's the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. Andy, what's wrong with a lower birth rate or do we just keep breeding and consuming? Well, you see, it's this funny thing, Andy, it's called perpetuating the population. Right, as you may be aware, the government made the heroic decision to ban the sale of all new diesel. Do you remember when they told us to buy diesel? Yeah, no, no, let's leave that one. And petrol cars by the year 2030 with electric cars, a la becoming and the average price falling between somewhere between uh, 40 and 50,000 quid. For the rich, that's not too much of a problem. You know, the sort of people who get wound up about climate change because it ruins their ski holidays in San Moritz. But for the plebs, you'll just have to deal with it. Even a UK chief of one of the largest makers of zero emission cars warned just the other day that the cost of batteries mean they have no plans for mass market product. And speaking of batteries, the sort of people who push for the green agenda are all about ethics. But we know, it's frequently Congolese children mining the cobalt just to help us feel better about our own carbon. Poor print. So, joining me to debate the ethics of going electric are Toby Young, Associate Editor at The Spectator, and Pete Knapp, Air Quality Student, PhD. Pete, hey. should we ban the sale of all electric cars by 2030? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would like to see... I, I definitely don't want to see a growth in them. I think this is what uh, I think car manufacturers want to see. They know uh, fossil fuel cars are fossils. They know they're going, but they want something to take the place. They want to push electric cars on us. And as you, as you were saying, we've got so many problems with the mining, with the resources, and I, I don't want to see them increase in, in, uh, in, in capacity on the, on the streets. I want to see them... Gone completely. Phased you out. want mass transit and no individual <laughs> choice. Toby, should we ban battery-powered cars by 2030? Well, I think there's a strong case. I mean, first of all, they're a, they're a bad proposition from a kind of consumer's point of view. So, um, more or less the cheapest electric car you can buy, a Fiat 500 zero-emissions electric car, costs upwards of £30,000. Um, we were told, you know, three years ago, when we were all urged to convert to electric, that soon charging points would spring up all over the United Kingdom. Actually, when you leave the big urban centres, when you travel further north, charging points are few and far between, and those that do exist, many of them are out of order. And if you can find one that's actually working, you have to queue for upwards of four hours to charge your car. So, you know, the anxiety of driving down the motorway in an electric car, worrying about whether it's going to run out of fuel before you get to a working charging point. I mean, is it worth the money just for that? Um, but as you say, you know, are they actually greener than petrol or diesel driven cars? I mean, you know, the carbon emissions involved in producing an electric car, because the batteries are so carbon intensive to produce, um, is much higher than the carbon footprint of producing uh, a petrol or diesel driven car. Um, the electricity you're using to power your electric car, which incidentally now costs you more to run than a petrol or diesel driven car because electricity prices have gone up so much in the yeah. last eight months, that the electricity you're using is driven by fossil fuels for the most part. So, you know, where's the, where's the greenery in that? So, you know, from a consumer's point of view, from an environmental point of view, they turn out to be completely Not so good. Tough. Pete, I, I was driven in to here tonight in an electric car and I got in the car and the guy was wearing a full parka and big hat <laughs> and he was scared to put on the heating because he said he'd run out of batteries. He said he goes past petrol stations and looks at them with sort of nostalgic 
joy. Yeah, yeah. Um, people do want to have the individuality and uh, individual choice to travel. Yeah. What are we going to replace cars with if these electric, disgusting, environmentally destroying cars are dreadful and the internal combustion engine isn't acceptable to you greeny types? Yeah, well, I... Uh... I would say, if we think back to uh, the, the audience watching this, may remember, some of them may remember what, what it was like in the 60s. If you take every car that you saw in the 60s and you multiplied it by four, that's what we've got today. So it, we, we have to scale that down. How? Why well, should we scale it down? Well, because I think we need to try to reduce our travel. I think we've got become Why? a little bit obsessed. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't with... we be going to our kids? You can go to Hawaii oh, on no, a no. rocket plane. That I, I mean, I mean tra travel in the sense of commuting. I think that the, the, the huge amount of traffic is created by the commute. No one likes the commute. And just imagine what it'd be like if there weren't if there weren't any traffic jams on on motorways. Instead, you got on a on a bus. Let's say that it was an, uh, uh, an electric bus. Now, this is where I would say that some electric vehicles are better. Um, if we take public transport and we electrify that, I think that's a great thing. I don't think it's a great thing for um, private cars, and mainly for the reasons that you were saying, uh, in terms of the consumption, the amount of resources required to do that. Someone watching this today is thinking about getting an electric car. I would say, think about it again, because if you do make that purchase, then you're, you're purchasing a huge amount of embedded carbon. And instead, I would perhaps even keep that car, drive it less, but get on buses more, campaign for better public transport. Single mum, three kids, different schools. Yeah, that's right. How do you... You can't say, you know, three young children, different schools. All I want is a... I completely agree with you ideologically. It's like, we need to reduce pointless journeys, Toby, all this sort of stuff. Single mum, three kids, and the shopping to do. Different schools in the morning, how does she do it? Yeah, um, well, if your kids are all going to different schools, um, then that's unfortunate. <laughs> I would say... Happens, that, kids have special needs, you know, oh, it, sure. family... Do you, yeah, but, you but I, I mean, I would, I would argue for schools, every school to cater for people with special needs. But uh, in, in this situation where people feel that they're tied into a, a problem where they are forced into having a car, I'd say that they're a victim of the car industry. Hang on, I mean, that's quite a good one, Tobes. A victim of, are you a victim of the car industry? Well, you are, because you've got loads of children, you disgusting eco-breeder. Four, yeah, but luckily they all go to the same school. Um, but um, I do feel that as a car driver, as a motorist, I do feel slightly victimised. I mean, you can't help And feeling, you're white as well. As a motorist, that you are, you know, you've become an unfashionable, picked-upon minority. I mean, you know, you've got bicycle lanes taking up, you know, half the road. Bicycle uh, supremacy. In places like Euston Road. Um, you know, you have to pay the congestion charge if you go into central London. Sadiq Khan is about to introduce, introduce this new charge. If you live in Oxford or Canterbury, if you go outside your 15-minute neighbourhood, you'll have to, you know, if you do it more than 100 times a year, you'll have to pay a penalty. You know, the war on the motorist. You know, it, it's never been at a higher pitch. And Can you the, hear this cry the, for the help, Pete? A kind of symbol of freedom, isn't but, it? But Why are we persecuting people for wanting the independence and freedom of having their own motor cars? We're a we are a majority. Why are we so put upon? Why are we so victimised? Who's going to speak, Lawrence, for the motorist? Pete, <laughs> speak for Toby. Defend this poor man. He can bet he's this bike supremacy. This bike supremacism. There's lots of things going on here. Let's address each problem and yeah, solve Toby's I, problem. I, I would say that the the the. The biggest victims here are the people who are unfortunately killed by cars. Now, if we look globally, that's about 1.35 million people every year who are killed. And in the UK, that translates to one death every 16 minutes. So that is a, a, a vast problem. When I say death, I mean death or serious injuries. Yeah, so. but I mean, let's not do that yeah. game, because I just go, you know, you eat tons of peanuts and crisps and you're going to die of a heart attack. Yeah. You know, pe well, people's yeah, life choices affect them. We, we Road traffic accidents into, into are... With... You can't drink and drive. You know, we're sure. doing everything we can to solve all that. Let's get away from that. Okay. Please defend my poor, victimised um, other guest <laughs> against the damage that he's suffering from bike supremacy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> bike supremacy. Oh, bike okay. supremacy, yeah. Uh, we, we, we think about uh, the number of people... Um, who have decided to start cycling, and I'm one of them. I used to be a driver. Um, now I've moved to London, and I'm making that a point because London has much better public transport than many other places. I was in a position where I could start to learn to actually cycle, and I loved it. I got around London quicker 
with less pollution, it was cheaper, and it was a free gym. It was excellent. To I love cycle it. around London was fantastic. And I found that going down roads with a particular cycle lane made things a lot easier. Yeah, and you do feel safer. There is an argument for all of it. Um, Tobes, well, final I, word. I, I, OK, final word. Um, Keep I was, it brief, because I was I cycling you. the other day uh, by Liverpool Street Station. Um, I tried to turn into a lane and I ran up against a barrier designed to protect cyclists from motorists and actually I ended up flat on my face. <laughs> Sometimes there are unintended consequences for penalising the motorist and helping the cyclist. I'm, I'm cut up inside. Thank you, gentlemen. Right, that was wonderful. Coming up, what gender was Jesus? Man, woman, people kind, something in between, perhaps. Find out after the break. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Jesus Christ, superstar, looks like a fella, but he wears a bra. Right. <laughs> In a new and supposedly radical production of Jesus Christ Superstar, put on by the Edinburgh University Savoy Opera Group, Jesus is being played by a non-binary actor, whatever that means, and Judas is being played by a woman. Making this version of the show the world's first gender-neutral production of the rock opera. Kill me now! The creative producer highlighted the gender-neutral castings as one of the most prominent features of the production. And the musical director said, taking away the boundaries of gendered roles allowed us to find a dynamic and captivating cast. 
Although Andrew Lloyd Webber has approved this change, he has insisted that they sing, I don't know how to love him, about Jesus rather than I don't know how to love them. Seems to me that this is a desperate corporate PR attempt to make headlines with a show that has lost its edge a long time ago. How can they claim this production is radical or controversial when they're towing the establishment line on gender and identity politics? Joining me to discuss this is Sam Dowler, because the guy who actually is making the show is too cowardly to turn up because he says he's got some problems with his mental health. Sam, hmm. tell me something. That's unfortunate. How do you look? Great, thank you. You do look wonderful. <laughs> How do you look a non-binary audi auditionee for Jesus Christ Superstar in the eye and say, why is this part not going to a non-binary person of colour? <sighs> Come on. I mean, look... So, trying to open it... up further cans of worms, Lawrence. Come um, on, love! As, as somebody who has acted a lot yourself, prolifically, let's say, um, yes. you know that directors strive to find something different to do. This is a 50-year-old musical, um, so they would be looking for something different, something to draw in the crowds, and they've got it. You've just said, you've just said, oh, they just want to get headlines and talk about it on the mainstream media, and here you are. But they're too scared to turn it... up and talk about it on here. Well, you, you, are, you are Sam Dowler Christ superstar. <laughs> you are the only person that will actually come on and defend this so-called oppressed community. Well, it's, no, what, what we're talking about here, like, it, this isn't to do with an oppressed community or anything, this is to do with art, and you know that art is subjective. And this is... But and Jesus this, was not... Yeah. Jesus wasn't white. Jesus... This non-binary thing Jesus is Jesus might not have existed either. That is, you know... Don't do that's that a, to me, It's brother. a moot point. So, I mean, this is, this is a story. Like, he also didn't sing, you know... I mean, whether he was real or not, I'm pretty sure he didn't sing musical numbers. I'm pretty sure he didn't have a multicoloured coat either that he splayed around. That was around Joseph. Place. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Still on, quite bad. Come on, love, get your theology I'm right. getting a beer. <laughs> Not really theology, more <laughs> musicology. All right, get your Philip Schofield parts right. But my point is, is that um, you know we've had, you know we've we've had, you know an all an all male. Um, uh, what's the, the what's the swan one? Oh God, um, I've forgotten. Um, swan, swan Lake. An all male. An <laughs> all male. Swan? Um, we've had an all male Swan Lake. We've had Glenda Jackson play King Lear. We've had like you know gender swapping of plenty of like uh, Shakespearean things. Of course, they try and keep it relevant. You've got um, Michelle, the wonderful Michelle Gale, playing Hermione in uh, the West End, um, and people were like, oh, but she's black. She can't be black. I mean, this is. Again, this is art. Art is subjective. Let's get let's get bums on seats. That is more important than than whining about who plays what. Of course, you know the the, um, the apostles, rather than played by men, as they are traditionally, uh, they're played by women and um, non-binary people. So I mean, like, so good for them. This is. I mean, I say let's watch the show first before we criticise it. Do you think there's more emphasis on uh, nowadays on being able to sort of switch gender than you can switch race, for example. You know, bear in mind that Jesus is a prophet in the, uh, in the Islamic religion as well, so he mm. sort of did exist. He would have not been a white person, mm. so surely there's character... Always surely there's a white person. Yeah, but surely... It's, yeah, OK, but that's the past, and as you say, we're looking at the future. We are. Surely this character should have been played by a non-binary person of colour. <laughs> Surely! Again, you're trying to, um, you know, poke the, poke the hornet's nest, I think, here, as per usual. Me, the, I darling. No, right? I'm getting the buzzing in my head already, but that could be something else. <laughs> um, <laughs> it could be my mental health. Yeah. Um, however, I think, you know, as I said, this is, this is, this is, you know, this is a, a, a great thing. It is, it is something different. It's not, it's not at the West End. It's in Edinburgh. I'm sure you'll try and find some sort of way to. It's uh, the National uh, Theatre uh, paying for it. Well, yeah, of course, yeah, that's that's fine. And and you know, and again, what you you know how important it is um, to support the arts and to, and to support theatres. Yeah, because they've supported me so much <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Those pats on the back and the calls for me to be denounced and, by. Uh, we the... couldn't say whose fault that was. Um, but what we will say is that is that it's important it's important for um for for the arts to, to to get people to go to to pay for the ticket to support the actors but there's no non-binary you know that... there's about three non-binary people in the whole of the world you've got, so you've, why got two, you've got two non-binary you've got two non-binary actors emma corrin and emma darcy playing two of the biggest parts at the moment one of them played diana in the crown and one of them is currently playing um a, a character in house of the dragon winning awards left right and center so okay. these, these are non-binary actors can no you... one has no one has batted an eyelid about the fact that they are non-binary can you actors. quickly That's their private tell life. me what non-binary means. It means that you don't lie with either male or female. Even though you've got 
Yeah, bit. but not not in not in your head. You're not. You don't feel that way, and that's you know, and that's your prerogative to say so. Okay, what do we agree about? That um, theatre is important. Yeah, and that um, acting is you know great. Whether you're a non-binary or not, something that you should get paid for if you're if you want to do it, and and also you know we support the arts in in the UK and around the world. Sam is a legend for coming. A spokesman from the production said, I think it's great that our production is getting a lot of attention from the press and it is so like important. Well, I'm, I'm, allowed, I'm allowed to take the mickey too. People take the mickey out of me, Sam. I think it's great that we're breaking down these boundaries in the theatre. That's what art is for. Anyway, thank you, Sam. It's now time where you put me on the spot. Fox on the spot, let's hear what you've got for me. Martin, could Reclaim merge with Reform? Well, you'd have thought it would be a good idea, wouldn't you? But old Ticey, he's, um, he's into Ticey. He's not here to defend himself, but he is into Ticey. Anyway, uh, how do snowplow drivers get to work? Uh, OK, I'm beyond that one. Lee, what's your view on tactical voting? I, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Look what happened when they kept trying to get everyone to vote for the Liberal Democrats. Tactical voting doesn't work. If people are Conservative and they don't have a Conservative party to vote for, they just won't turn up and vote. And if they do turn up and vote for Reform or for me or for anybody else, they'll just keep the Conservatives out of power. The most important thing in this country is we have a Conservative party and the Labour party. And that's what we need. Those that represent the workers and those that represent the affluent or the you know, middle class. Anyway, that was me, um, smart as hell, or as always. Keep sending them in, your views at gbnews.uk. Thank you to all my guests tonight and for you joining me. Up next is Dan. Dan, what do you have for us? Oh, well, Lawrence, that was a really difficult conversation for me because do you know, Sam Dowler, uh, your previous guest, one of my very good friends, but Jesus Christ Superstar, my favorite musical of all time. In fact, the greatest musical ever written. And the idea of a non-binary Jesus is I think the most ridiculous thing I have heard so far this year, and I have heard many ridiculous things. But we've got a big show ahead, Megan Kelly, Nigel Farage, Lee Anderson all on the way. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm so glad we share the same musical love. I love it too. Uh, back after the break, don't miss Dan, the wonderful Dan. Bye, 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 bye. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst and welcome to your latest broadcast from the Met Office. Still the risk of some fog and freezing fog patches, particularly across southern parts of England. Through the next 24 hours we will see rain pushing south and we can see that nicely on the pressure chart. A cold front pushes southwards across the UK, but high pressure always nearby, meaning those weather fronts will be on the weak side. Generally staying dry for many as we end the week, but weather fronts always nearby towards the north. Through this evening time, frost and fog reforming across central and southern parts of England. Elsewhere, generally quite cloudy, particularly as we head into the early hours, some rain and drizzle pushing in across the north and the west. Here, mild temperatures holding up minus five or minus six, again across central southern England as we head towards Wednesday morning. Cloudy, foggy start across the south, the fog patches dense in places. Band of rain pushing south across northern parts of the UK. This light and patchy generally, behind it though, turning brighter into the afternoon across Scotland and Northern Ireland. There will be some showers across northern Scotland, one or two of these heavy. Cloudy and cold across the south of England, five or six degrees at best, seven to nine across the north of the UK. So feeling a little fresher than it has over the last couple of days here. Through Wednesday evening, that cloud and rain pushes and clears south of England. Then a clear night to come, particularly across central areas. A few showers around coastal parts in that northerly breeze. But under the clearer skies, it'll allow temperatures to dip away. So generally falling two to five Celsius in towns and cities, a little below freezing in the countryside. But enough of a breeze generally to keep it fro frost and fog free for many. Into Thursday, we'll see a bit of a westy split developing, cloudier skies towards the east, but there will be some brighter spells here, though one or two showers are possible. Best of the sunshine across the west, unbroken in places, generally a light northerly breeze. Over the next few days, high pressure holds on, keeps it largely dry. Weak weather fronts try to move in from the north and temperatures around average.
We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun, every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. The special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8pm Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feature? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm 